This podcast contains disturbing and violent content. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Criminal Conduct. 911. Hey! Uh, uh, please get something to my office. What's please, going on? Please, my girlfriend, I think she just shot herself in front of her, please. She what? She shot herself. Michelle O'Connell dies from a gunshot wound to the mouth. The sheriff, David Shore, says that she took her own life. That case was a suicide, tragic suicide. That truthfully could have been predicted if people had been paying attention maybe more closely. Jeremy Banks had nothing to do with that case. Her mother, Patty O'Connell, says that the sheriff is protecting one of their own. She says that Jeremy Banks is responsible for Michelle's death. Nobody asked us any questions. Nobody really wanted our opinion. Almost 10 years later, a private citizen named Eli Washtock started investigating her death. New at 10, only Action News Jax was able to get to the condo where Washtock was found Thursday. And you can see there the door has been replaced. Someone was after them. And now he's dead. New at 10, only Action News Jack spoke with a neighbor who gave us chilling details about the mysterious death of a person in the World Golf Village. Eli Washtock, the private citizen who personally financed an investigation into the Michelle O'Connell death, is now a victim himself. It just doesn't make sense. Who could have done this? And what new information did he learn before he died? We have so many questions and so much to learn from Eli Washtock. But now he's gone. We're gonna retrace Eli Washtock's investigation, and in the process, we're gonna to try to find out who wanted him dead. From the creators of Twisted and Pretend, this is Criminal Conduct Season 1 an investigative podcast looking into the death of Michelle O'Connell and the murder of Eli Washtock. You know, producing a true crime podcast, especially like Criminal Conduct, where it involves multiple episodes and you're unraveling this really complicated story, it's a lot like building a puzzle. You start thinking it's one thing and then it unfolds into something else. Well, guess what? Now there is this game that I've been playing with my family called Odd Pieces. It's a jigsaw puzzle, but instead of just building a pretty picture or a nice, beautiful scene, you are actually solving a mystery. So each piece you lay down reveals another clue, and you are basically the detective. I'm telling you, this took puzzles to a whole new level. And if you are looking for a cool gift idea, I'm telling you, this one is it. Go to oddpieces.com slash criminal and use the code criminal at checkout for an exclusive 15% off your entire Odd Pieces order. I'm telling you, this is not an ordinary puzzle. Ordinary puzzles are boring. Try mystery puzzles by Odd Pieces. These puzzles will blow your mind and transport you to a world of endless possibilities. It's like watching a movie and anticipating and anticipating what the cliffhanging plot twist is going to be. But instead of watching a movie, you're actually spending quality time with your friends and your family, and you get to see the mystery unravel before your very eyes. Go to oddpieces.com slash criminal and use code criminal at checkout for an exclusive 15% off your entire Odd Pieces order. That's oddpieces.com slash criminal. Use code criminal at checkout. Quarter mile, turn left. Oh, there we are. We are traveling to meet Ed Slavin. He's also someone in St. Augustine who knows a lot of people and talks to a lot of people and uh, is pretty active in the community. But you know, every town has that guy who's like the community watchdog. In 800 feet, your destination will be on the left. Hey, there he is. How you doing, Ed? Good, good to meet you. John Taylor. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi. 
This is Javier. When John and I first arrived in St. Augustine, Florida, one of the first people we wanted to speak with was Ed Slavin. Ed runs a local blog called Clean Up the City of St. Augustine. In his blog, he's not just advocating for more park benches and planting flowers. Ed Slavin wants to uproot corruption from within the city and county government. And it turns out that the nation's oldest city has plenty of it. Ed Slavin seemed to know everything and anybody who's anybody in St. Augustine. So when Eli Washtock started looking into the Michelle O'Connell case, the mayor of St. Augustine, Nancy Shaver, introduced Eli Washtock to Ed Slavin. So what do you remember? Not necessarily, I mean, if you remember the specific date, but when this was that you met with him, was it November of 2018, December 18, or when it was that you met with him? I think it would have been maybe July, August, uh, September timeframe of uh, 2018. The one time we actually met in person. Here's the first email Eli sent Ed Slavin. Quote, Dear Ed Slavin, My name is Eli Washtock, and I'm trying to reach out to anyone I can regarding the Michelle O'Connell case. What I'm trying to do is find someone who will kindly give me a few minutes of their time to help me find a way to help the O'Connell family if they are still fighting for justice. Please understand, I do not work for the media. I'm not a journalist, nor am I a lawyer. I am simply an average, everyday citizen of St. Augustine with above-average expectation for this family. Thank you in advance, Eli." Unquote. At first, Ed Slavin must have thought Eli Washtock was just another concerned citizen saying all the right things. But Eli Washtock wasn't just paying lip service. When he first wrote this email back in 2018, he wanted justice. He wanted Michelle O'Connell's boyfriend, Jeremy Banks, to be arrested and prosecuted. But that seemed like a long shot at best. You see, Michelle O'Connell died eight years earlier in 2010. And since then, there have been many attempts to bring in new evidence and possibly turn this case from a suicide to a homicide. Throughout this podcast, we're going to hear from people who have come to Michelle O'Connell's defense. But no one has intrigued us like Eli Washtock. Javier and I searched the internet looking for any information we could find on him. But he's a virtual ghost. We found almost nothing. There's only a single picture of Eli, and it's not a very good one. He doesn't have many friends that we know of, and he doesn't even have a profile on any social media platform. Eli Washtag pretty much kept to himself. In an age when most of us are obsessed with sharing every single experience, Eli chose to keep his thoughts and activities private. So if Eli Washtag didn't leave behind a digital footprint, what was he like in real life? Ed Slavin is actually one of the few people we know who has met him in person. Describe what he was like in person. Like, what did he what did he look like? How did he present himself? Just what were your were your opinions of him when you met uh, him? Tall, thin, ponytail, um, nice guy. Ed says that he only met Eli once in person. He was impressed by how far Eli got with Michelle's investigation. They continued to correspond over email right up until his death. What was your first thought when you heard that it might have been Eli? Retaliation for protected activity and investigating the case. And, and it's something that he, he certainly feared. He, and that's why he said that he had the, the notebook in multiple places. He had multiple lawyers. He had several lawyers in Wisconsin who were friends, but he was very near close to having uh, a conclusion to the multiple investigations that he'd commissioned. And he'd spent tens of thousands of dollars. But we wanted to know why Eli Washtock dedicated his final days to try to solve a case for a woman he never even met. Here's Patty O'Connell, Michelle's mom, telling us about the first time she was introduced to Eli Washtock. And I get this call from Ed, and Ed said, hey, this is young man. Uh, he wants to investigate your daughter's death. And he said, I think we should meet him. And so, yeah, I was, all of a sudden I had like a new hope. But before they arranged to meet, Eli called Patty on the phone to discuss the case. And he was always very prayerful, hopeful. You know, he always mentioned like, like he's praying for justice for Michelle. I had a lot of confidence and he had said that he was going to put a lot into this investigation. You know, he was going to be very thorough. He says, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to contact you every once a week, like every Friday and give you updates of what's going on. So that was, you know, that gave me hope. I never asked him where he worked. Yeah. I just thought there's this young man who might have a lot of money and wants to solve the case. Here's one of the first emails Eli sent Patty O'Connell. Quote, Dear Patty, thank you for your email. 
I'm happy to see that you're still fighting for justice. I became worried when I noticed there wasn't any updates or news on this case. At first, I didn't know who to turn to or who to ask for help. I understand that this is a very complex case. I want you to know that you have my strength and support every step of the way. I am a full-time father. I have two children myself, and I know that if anything ever happened to me, like what happened to Michelle, I would want someone like me to be fighting for me. We will get justice for Michelle. You and your family are in my thoughts and prayers. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Please take care. Eli." Unquote. Ten months after sending this email to Patty, Eli will be shot down in his own apartment. But why? And here we are, Javier and I, trying to figure it all out. Oh, for a long time, when we started this project, yeah. it felt like the only thing we knew about Eli was that he died. Yeah. We n knew nothing about him. No, right? and I still don't know a whole lot. When was the first time that you physically... It's in November. We met at the lawyer's office. We uh, went there November the 9th, 2018. Okay. And I met him there. That was the first time you ever met yeah, him? Yeah, it was the first time I ever met him. He's tall and slender, and he wore his hair pulled back really tight like a like in the hippie days, you know. To me, he had really high cheekbones, you know. And I, the minute I saw him, I said, oh, I think he's part Indian, like American Native Indian. We just said hello at first, and then when we walked out, we got in my car. We sat in the parking lot and talked for about maybe 10, 15 minutes. Uh, it was my first time meeting him, and I just, I just thought, Oh my gosh, this is like, this is prayer in action. This young man is going to help Michelle. Eli Washtock and Patty O'Connell made arrangements to meet with an attorney to find out what legal options they could explore regarding Michelle's case. But when they got to the lawyer's office, the attorney they thought they were going to meet didn't show up. She wasn't there that day. We thought she was going to be there. Eli was disappointed. Instead, Eli and Patty met with a different attorney at the same firm. I'm sitting in this room, and, and he had a file, he had a, a binder, really, very thick binder with all his information, investigation, you know, documents. Do you remember what color the binder was? Yep, white, definitely white. Three ring binder? Yeah. And it was like, I want to say it was like about that big. The binder was three to four inches thick, full of documents that Eli had already collected. The attorney told Eli and Patty that the political environment in the state of Florida just wasn't in their favor, and now wasn't a good time to pursue this case. But she offered to keep the evidence Eli had collected in his binder. And like she had, she had asked, well, I'll keep the binder. And he, no, I'm taking it. So we get back in the car and he said, I had $3,000. I was just going to give her. I could tell even Eli having that much money on him was a little bit shaky. Patty O'Connell tells us that Eli was very protective of this binder. He kept it safe at all times. Eli had explained to me that he kept everything in a vault at a bank and that he had actually wanted me to take the key to the vault, but I was like, oh, Eli, I'm so scared. I'm really frightened. I don't want to take the, the key to the vault. He says, it's all right, that's okay, because that's where he kept his files on Michelle. Patty never did gain access to Eli's safe deposit box. That means that this binder full of evidence that Eli locked away in a bank is gone, but who has it? Now that Eli Washtock is dead, everything in his possession is in the hands of Putnam County Sheriff's Office, the neighboring county law enforcement entity investigating Eli's death. You know, I feel bad now because I would have had access to that had I, Putnam County went into the vault and got, they had a warrant to go to the vault and take Eli's file. So what exactly was in this binder? Patty O'Connell tells us that Eli felt he was on the verge of a breakthrough in Michelle's case. Eli told me the last time I saw him, he says to me, this is a bombshell. When Sheriff Shore gets this, this is going to really get him upset. But that bombshell never dropped. And Sheriff David Shore is not going to press charges against Jeremy Banks anytime soon. And without any new evidence, there will be no movement on Michelle's death investigation. 
Eli Washtalk's investigation evolved quite dramatically since the first time he emailed Ed Slavin. Eli hired forensic experts, lawyers, and private investigators to follow Jeremy. As a result, Eli felt like he was drawing some unwanted attention. When you met with him, did he, or on the phone, did he ever talk about being concerned about um, anybody being after him? Yes. What did, what did he say? He said Jeremy Banks ran him off the road. Did he give you any specifics on that incident? Uh, just that he and his son were in a vehicle and that uh, Jeremy Banks ran him off the road. And the reason he knew it was Jeremy Banks is he had Banks under surveillance and he knew the, the deputy car number that Banks drove at the time. We asked Patty O'Connell if Eli Washtalk ever told her he feared for his safety. So I, I'm curious about that because I've heard about this incident where like Eli was ran off the road with... Yeah, no, he was very like, Jeremy ran me off the road in his patrol car. Was he investigating Jeremy at the time or was it just one of those things where he just saw him at an no, intersection? No, he had already been like a few months into the investigation. He had told me he had people watching Jeremy. I think, in my opinion, is Jeremy uh, realized he was being watched. I don't know what part of the road it took place. I don't have all the facts. You know, and I said, Eli, I'm scared for you. And he says, don't worry, I have protection. After Eli's death, Patty asked Eli's son about the car incident with Jeremy Banks. I just asked him, do you remember what day you and your father were run off the road by Jeremy? He says, no, but it's on my dad's phone. So there, I believe it's, there's evidence out there, but I don't know how to get it. And then there was this report from a neighbor right after Eli Washtalk died. A WJAX TV reporter asked Eli's neighbor, Alec Laughlin, if Eli thought he was in danger. He knew that somebody was coming for him, so he rented the place downstairs, didn't tell anybody, let his kids stay there. And he stayed in his regular place. So he knew it was coming. According to the neighbor, Eli rented a condo two floors below him for his son to sleep in at night. When the reporter asked Eli's neighbor if he thought that Eli's death had anything to do with the Michelle O'Connell investigation, this is what he had to say. Didn't tell me, didn't tell any, any neighbors anything like that. But Patty O'Connell believes that Eli had every reason to fear for his family's safety. He knew it was dangerous. I think in his, like maybe in he was thinking, this is really serious and I'm getting to the truth of what really happened to Michelle. I think Eli might have been threatened more than I know. I didn't know that, that this would be so dangerous at first until he told me Jeremy ran him off the road. Then I really got scared. It seems like Eli Washtalk lived his final days in a state of paranoia. Why would anyone want to hurt him? Things just weren't adding up. But it turns out that his anxiety and fears were far from fantasy. I mean, someone did want Eli Washtalk dead, but who? And when they told me he was killed, my first thought was somebody is protecting Jeremy. I, I didn't think, I had no question Jeremy would not take a chance. Everyone we've spoken to who was close to Eli believes that his death was connected to the involvement in Michelle O'Connell's death investigation but they have no way of proving these accusations. Ebros, I'm the director of law enforcement for the Putnam County Sheriff's Office. This is Putnam Office. County Sheriff's Office Representative Steve Rose talking to reporters shortly after they discovered Eli's body. Uh, just to reiterate a little bit, is we are here on behalf of a request from the St. John's County Sheriff's Office to assume an investigation that they started in involving a suspicious death. Before we continue, let's explain what's happening here. Eli Washtalk died in the same Florida county as Michelle O'Connell. St. John's County. When St. John's deputies responded to the emergency call around 7.30 a.m. on the morning of January 31st, 2019, they somehow determined that Eli Washtalk was looking into Michelle's case. St. John's County spent nearly four hours inside Eli's condo before recusing themselves from the investigation to avoid any possible conflict of interest. St. John's Sheriff's Office turned over Eli's case to neighboring Sheriff's Office Putnam County. FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, also recused themselves from the case because of their prior involvement with the Michelle O'Connell case. So let's go back to the press conference with Putnam County. 
This is in the, this person's home. They live there. Yes, sir. Okay. Were they targeted? Uh, this time, we don't know that. We heard that they were in fear for their life. Do you know anything about that? Again, this is early in the investigation. Um, at this time, we do not have any witnesses. Who, Who found, found him? Them? It was actually his son. Do you know how old his son is? He is a juvenile. Is there a threat to the community at all? We don't believe so. So can, you can't say if it was, if you believe it was suicide or a homicide, you're not sure on either side yet. At this point, it's still too early in the investigation. But it seems suspicious? Yes. Do you know why the victim was looking into the O'Connell case? I have no idea. I think, just, right, I just think we're trying to understand if there's no threat to the community, but there's not a suspect caught, that there's a little bit of confusion between those, those two facts. Again, because of the nature of the investigation, I cannot divulge why we believe that, but we are confident that there is no threat to the community. So let me get this straight. It was a suspicious death. There is no suspect, yet the authorities are confident that there is no threat to the community? Hmm. Notice that the truth likely leaked out the second time the reporter asked a question. The first time, the spokesman said, we don't believe so, in reference to a threat to the community. The second time, he answered, we are confident there is no threat to the community. That's a bold statement. It's also a statement that can box a law enforcement agency into a corner, investigatively. We've made several requests to Putnam County asking to see even just a basic incident report. We have received nothing to date. Officially, Putnam County has said very little about Eli Washtock's death investigation. They provided no information about Eli or even the circumstances or nature of his death. They didn't even initially reveal his name. What is the reason they can't give the report out? Because it's an ongoing investigation. And it could go on forever. That's right. As long as they don't consider it closed, it could be that we can't get the information. And no one will ever find out any any more facts. Other know? than doing our own, which is why we need to go out and try to interview the neighbor and yeah. try to talk to people. Putnam County didn't say much about Eli's death, but there was one piece of information that they felt was really important to share with the public. And it was about Eli Washtock's gender identity. Well, the information that we have from people that we have talked to is the person does identify as both a male and a female going by a male name and then also a female name as well. Eli Washtock identified as both male and female. Is this true? And if so, how is this even relevant to the case? We asked Patty O'Connell what she knew about Eli's gender identity. One of the things that threw us off at the beginning of this yeah. was that every report about Eli started with the fact that he might be transgender. That really threw us off. Yeah, me too. I mean, that was put out there by the police, though. The very first thing. None of the neighbors that were interviewed that I've looked back, I've looked back, they always said, he was a man. Eli Washtock's birth name was Craig Washtock. Court records show that Eli legally changed his name to Ellie Marie Washtock in 2009. Eli is short for Ellie. I believe the police wanted that out there first. Yeah, I see no value in releasing that piece of information no, other than that it could be seen as inflammatory yeah. or demeaning yeah. because it doesn't do, it, it provides no context. Yeah. It does nothing to help anyone solve the homicide. And Con considering that you and I, John, have spoken now to several people that knew Eli and no one, no one that we have met yeah. has referred to yeah. him as Ellie, not one person. I mean, the very first time I actually looked him, his name up and came back, he said his name was Eli. And then I said, it said Eli. And there was Ellie. I said, oh, your wife's name is Ellie. He says, no, I don't have a wife. And he never told me anything about Ellie. He just dropped it. Of course, you can't tell if someone is transgender just because they changed their name or just by looking at their appearance. Everyone we've spoken to said that Eli Washtock identified himself as male. But maybe Eli didn't feel comfortable disclosing his gender identity with people around him, even Patty. So we reached out to organizations in St. Augustine's LGBTQ community to see if anyone knew of Ellie Marie Washtock. No one had heard of Ellie, Eli, or Craig Washtock. Why did the police release this information when they released almost nothing about the case? 
I believe there's some level of implication that his gender identity had something to do with his death. Of course, this release set a strong narrative that could potentially shape people's perceptions about this case without having any facts. The transgender angle resulted in not only a dead end, but it blocked us from certain witnesses. Why was it so important for them to put this information out to the public immediately? All we knew about Eli was that he died suspiciously. Although Ellie Marie is most commonly considered a female's name, that really is the only thing we know that would lead anyone to believe that Eli is transgender. Everyone we've spoken to referred to Eli as male, and no one gave any indication of Eli identifying anything other than male. Therefore, in order to avoid making assumptions about his gender identity, John and I have decided to refer to Eli the same way he presented himself to the people we've spoken to and the people who knew him best as male. Eli's family held a memorial service and funeral in St. Augustine, Florida. It was a private gathering, just Eli's son, daughter, mother, father, sister, and his ex-girlfriend. The family also invited Patty O'Connell. When I went to the funeral, um, and they, they had his casket covered in sunflowers. After the service, they proceeded to the cemetery, but for Patty O'Connell, it was far too familiar territory. I think he's like two, three, three places away from Michelle. There was an empty spot and uh, they couldn't get that for him, you know. And then uh, he had already made like, uh, told his son, I want sunflowers. If anything happens to me, I want to be buried here. His son told him, he never said this to me. If anything happened, that that's where he'd want to be. But see, I think he already knew they were after him. I don't know. I don't know who was after him, but he knew that he might not come out of this. Do you, and he was in his 30s, right? Yeah, he was... Um, 38, maybe? I think, yeah, 38. But that's yeah. like kind of an unusual thing for somebody in their 30s to talk about. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm approaching 40. I haven't even had that conversation yeah. with my family. Yeah. John and I drove to the cemetery to visit Eli and Michelle's graves. Hmm. And sure enough, a few feet away from Michelle's grave was Eli's gravestone. With all the confusion surrounding Eli, we wondered, what name would we find on his headstone? So my guess is that would that his I thought he would have Craig Washtock on his tombstone, but I really wanted to check that because um, I didn't know if they would go by his uh, what we think is his legally changed name, Ellie Marie Washtock. Yeah. His gravestone read, Craig Washtock, with the name Eli written in quotes underneath his birth name. Whoever made the arrangements did not recognize Eli's new legal name. Eli came into Patty's life out of nowhere and then vanished just as mysteriously. I never asked questions. All I knew is here's this man. I've been praying for my daughter's case and this man is helping me like, oh, I'm sorry, but almost look like an angel. Yeah. You know, like here comes this angel in my in my life and God, had, but then I found out he had some kids, you know, he showed me pictures of his two children. What did he say about his kids? Oh, he loved them. He said, these, these they, they mean everything to me. There was a time when Eli and his son went to visit Michelle's grave and it was so dry. It doesn't rain sometimes and it gets really dry. And then the sprinkler system doesn't reach Michelle's grave. Eli said one time they were gonna go out one day and play football. Him and his son were gonna play football outside, and but it was raining. And he said his son said, "Well, at least Michelle's grave will get some rain." You know, so I mean, I thought that I never forgot that he said that. Yeah. You know, like the son cared about Michelle. Eli Washtock sparked hope in Patty's life. Hope that in Michelle's case. One day, justice will be served, but his absence brings fear to her life. And I got so scared from Eli being killed that I, that chair, well, I had it against that door because I was afraid. I was scared at night to sleep. Patty says that she no longer visits her daughter's grave for fear of being followed. 
because I thought, when you found out. yeah, I said, because I'm the one that gave Eli the um, autopsy photos. I said, oh my gosh, he was with me. They pro they have cameras, you know, I, I said, they were probably watching him all this time, even, even maybe after Jeremy ran him off, you know, so I had no doubt in my mind, uh, there was never an, a single thought that anybody else would have done this to him. Three months after Eli Washtock's death, the medical examiner ruled his death a homicide. The Putnam County Sheriff's Office released a short statement indicating Eli's manner of death was homicide. The autopsy was withheld. There was no information on cause of death. Though many people were suspicious, now it was official. Eli died as a result of a deliberate act of one or more other people. Okay, with this being a murder, we need to recreate the contents of that binder. We have to figure out what explosive evidence Eli supposedly uncovered against Jeremy Banks. So John, do you think that there is a direct link between Eli looking into Michelle's case and his murder? Eli investigated Jeremy Banks. Someone murdered Eli. We have a correlation, but not causation yet. As an investigator, I think it's very unlikely Eli's murder is related to Michelle's case. Possible but unlikely. You have to start close to the victim and work your way out. Otherwise, you spend too much time chasing theories. But, it, but it do, doesn't it seem like everyone just immediately jumped to the obvious conclusions? I mean, it would make a great story, but the idea of these two cases being directly related, it's way down on my list of likely motives and perpetrators behind Eli's murder. Well, if it's not Jeremy, then who? Next time on Criminal Conduct. We're going to take you inside the scene right before Michelle died. When Mark said, I've got a pulse, Jeremy's whole thing, his whole demeanor changes. I went to take him by the arm and walk him out. I smelled the alcohol on him and he starts pacing out in the driveway and growling. I, that's all I can say. He sounds like he's growling. He was angry. He just was like, ah. And you're going to hear from Eli Washtock's childhood friends. Yeah, he asked me. There, there's no doubt in my mind that this, that it's all, it's all tied together somehow. What did they know about his unexpected death? The only thing he was doing with his life was investigating this murder, suicide, whatever you want to call it. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, supposedly he's turned up some good stuff and now he's gone. That's next time on Criminal Conduct. A special thanks to our executive producer, Advertise Cast, and to Ruby Rose Fox for allowing us to use her song, Bury the Body. Her music is available anywhere you can purchase music. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, make sure to check out our other shows. John Taylor hosts a podcast called Twisted. John unravels intricacies of true crime and does a deep dive analysis of some of the most thought-provoking crime cases. And check out the show Pretend Podcast. It's hosted by me, Javier Leva. Pretend is a true crime documentary style podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. I interview con artists and their victims. The links to both of our shows are in the show notes. A new episode of Criminal Conduct is out next week. Creative Babble.